Are you in here now? Hello, uh, my name is Frank Sarantella. Um, for those of you who have followed me, you pretty much know who I am and what Jesus has done in my life. For those of you who don't know who I am or have <coughs> never seen me speak, um, because I've got a lot of material to cover, if you want to read my testimony, it's here on my website, midnightcry.com. And it goes into a pretty, not a very detailed, but detailed enough where in 1984, Jesus changed my life. I walked with the Lord for a while. I backslid in 2012. They had to close the expressways in Chicago. I was 360 pounds. Um, and they had to pull me out of my truck and then rushed me to a hospital, uh, actually a uh, trauma center. And on the fourth day in intensive there, in, the fourth day in intensive care, the doctor came in and told me I should be dead. Now, if you'd like to read all the details on that, um, that's all in my testimony. The Lord then sent me down from Chicago to West Palm Beach, and it's been Jesus and I, and he's been sharing his heart with me and teaching me in the word, and he's given me two messages. The first message that the Lord has given me is that judgment is coming soon, as in very soon. The second message that the Lord has given me is that his people, Christians, are not prepared for the vengeance that God is going to execute for the covenant. And so that's pretty much the messages I've been sharing with people. And that's why if you go on my website, midnightcry.com, um, you'll see that the Lord has had me write five books. They're on Amazon.com and BarnesandNobles.com. But you can read them all in their entirety on my website, midnightcry.com, along with um, video teachings the board has allowed me to have and some interesting articles and just some things to draw you closer to God. Because remember, and this is what is important, you, just like me, are going to stand before God all alone. You don't want to be wrong. When the word of God says that people go to hell, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. People go to hell for their lack of knowledge. It's because they lack the knowledge, the revelation knowledge in God's word. Oh, they may have intellectual knowledge and they may be able to dissect God's word left and right. But it's the revelation knowledge that changes our minds and our hearts and transforms us to have the heart of Jesus, which is a heart of love, humility, and compassion. Now, last week we started in a two-part series, and the first part is called The Coming Darkness. And I'm gonna this I'm gonna backtrack and I'm gonna give you a little bit of what we what we reviewed last week because the second message which I'm gonna give you today that the Lord has opened my eyes to in the last few days. Has been heartbreaking because the Lord has revealed what the darkness is and what's going to take place and I cannot stress enough I cannot stress enough I cannot stress enough you need to go into your Bible and talk to the Lord and ask him to teach you and show you and give you revelation and I tell you as I've said so many times don't take my word for it. If you need to watch this video over and over again, then do it. But take notes and read the word of God that I share with you. And you go to the word of God and let the Lord teach you and give you revelation so that you can see that the truth of God's word has been revealed. And you can be like the noble Bereans to search the scriptures to see if these things be so. That's what's important. Again, you're going to stand before God all alone, and you don't want to be wrong. And with what's coming up shortly, you need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God because there is an assault on the Word of God for the sake of, of unity at any cost. That's why the Lord has, has told me that the church system today is now called the Congregation of Compromise. They're compromising the Word of God, and God is a God of great detail every jot and every fiddle. Now that being said, 
In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and this is going to be a quick review. We're not going to get real in-depth on this. So if you want to go back to the first video of last week, part 1, the coming darkness, we went into a little bit more detail, but I'm just going to go into Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Period. That is a statement. In Genesis verse 2, your Bible will probably read, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's been mistranslated. If you go back into the Hebrew, you will see that the word was, should be, had become, form and void, form desolate, void a wasteland. Darkness is darkness, but it's an evil darkness. It's demonic darkness. And the deep can actually be translated into the abyss, the abusos. So verse 2 should read, the earth had become desolate and wasteland and evil was on the face of the abyss. Now we get that because if we go into Revelation chapter 12, it tells us what happened. Because from verse 1 to verse 2, there's a gap. And you will see that in verse in Revelation chapter 12, you will see verse 7. This is the war that took place in heaven. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now listen and pay attention closely. Now again, you go back and you read your Bibles. Revelation 12, 9. Listen, it says, So the great dragon was cast out of that was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world and he was cast to the earth and his angels his demons were cast out with him so when the war broke out in heaven God cast him to the earth and that's when the earth became desolate and a wasteland and evil was was all over the abyss the earth had become the abyss. Satan never left the earth. Satan makes his appearance because in verse uh, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, God has the creation. In the first day, he made the heavens the earth. He made the, the moon, the stars. Chapters 1 and 2 in Genesis are the creation. God speaking the word of God into effect and the word of God creating everything. The word of God being Jesus. Jesus creating everything. That's Colossians, you can read that in Colossians, chapter 3, if I'm not mistaken. But, Satan never left the earth. And, in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent, Satan, was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, now listen, this is important because this is what we need to know for today. What took place in the Garden of Eden Thousands of years ago is taking place today, and we need to know this. And Satan said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit and the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And listen to what Satan says. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day of, that you eat it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan twisted the word of God. He manipulated the word of God. He put doubt and unbelief in the word of God to the woman, so she's thinking, well, maybe he didn't say that. Maybe uh, it'll be okay. Well, it, 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 we're not going to die. And then you can be like God. Lucifer, Satan, is telling her that she can have all of the attributes to be like God. Because that's exactly why Lucifer was thrown out of heaven in the first place. And if you go to Isaiah chapter 14, you will see that the Lord speaks 
in verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will also sit I will on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. So Lucifer wanted to make Eve like her, like him. He lied to her. And ladies and gentlemen, what's going to be revealed in this teaching is how we are being lied to today because what's going on in the name of God, and again, what did Lucifer do? God has not said that, has he? God knows it. When you do this, you're going to be like God. The same ploy that Satan used in the Garden of Eden is being done today, and it's being done so subtly that most people have no idea what's going on. And what's going on right now is the assault on God's word and the whole religious system, and I say the whole religious system, that's from Catholics, Baptists, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, every single denomination and non-denomination is assaulting the word of God because they are not speaking the whole word of God. And not only that, there's religious organizations that have sprung out some as long as 1948 that have decided that they want to put a church system into place. And we're going to get into that. But what is happening now is there's multitudes of translations of the Word of God. And, and the most popular one is the NIV. It's the New International Version of God's Word. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. And you will see, if you read in the beginning of the New International Version, that Many religions got together and decided they wanted to come up with a Bible that was easy to read, that could be embraced by all religions, which is a complete lie. And if you read, and if you go on my website at midnightcry.com, I've got a PDF file on there that um, I, and actually you can look it up for yourself on Google, fallacies of the NIV or mistranslations of the NIV, and you will see how they break it down and how they don't, they, they take the word homosexual out. And use a feminine because they didn't want to offend the homosexual community. They take the word commandment and they translate it to commands because they don't want to offend people with the law of God and that they're trying to um, ignore the law of God by taking out the word commandments. And if you go there and you do some study, you'll find that out. And that's why I cannot encourage you now, especially now, you need to get your own revelation from God and stop listening to the garbage that's being preached on TV and in the radio because they're manipulating the Word of God because they don't want to offend people. When you read the Word of God, when there were crowds following Jesus, Jesus would say things that would thin out the crowd. And you can look at that in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33, and you will see a great multitude of people follow Jesus. And then Jesus told them, unless you hate your father, your mother, your sister, your blood, your brother, your wife, and your children, you cannot be my disciple. Now, when he said the word hate, he didn't mean despise them, but he used it to emphasize that I have to be number one. You have to love me above everything. And then in John chapter 6, when Jesus told the crowd of people, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. John 6, 66 said, and many of his disciples followed him no more. Jesus has never been interested in big crowds. God has never been interested in crowds. He's interested in quality, not quantity. And what has happened today, starting 2019, which was in 2018, which was in 2017, which in 2016, through the last, since the inception of the electronical church that started in the late 70s, the emphasis has always been numbers, not quality, but quantity. And it's become a religious race to see who can get the biggest congregations and who get the most three-by-five cards signed and who can report to headquarters that we've gotten five saved, seven saved. It's never been about preparing you to stand before God and give an account of your life because that's what's important. 
And when Jesus came, the very first message that Jesus preached when he came out of the wilderness was to repent. And true repentance is not tears. True repentance is not saying a prayer. True repentance is a change. You no longer do your old sins, but you stop them and you start following Jesus. If you had a problem with lust, you stop lusting. That's repentance. When John the Baptist preached repentance, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, the message was stop and prove to God that you are sorry for your sins. That message of repentance is all through the Old Testament and all through the New Testament. There has never been a message except Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you'll be saved. That's never been, never has been, never will be. The, 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 the message that God has always preached through his prophets and his disciples, repent, change your ways, stop your sinning, and bear fruit. Prove to me that you're stopped sinning. That's why God told the, the prophet Hosea to go marry a whore, because God's people were playing the harlot. They were not being faithful to him. And we have not been faithful to God, and God is calling us to repent. And that's why the darkness has gotten so dark, and it's going to get even darker, is because the message of repentance and stop sinning is no longer being cried out in the land. And what has happened is they're turning the word of God, and they're twisting the word of God to make it easy believism. Now here's where it gets really heartbreaking. In Matthew 24, it's the return of Jesus. The disciples ask him when he's coming. And what's really interesting is that this message is preached right after Matthew 23, where Jesus exposes all of the false prophets, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. One of the most talked about doctrines in all of the Word of God, and it starts in Deuteronomy, actually. Well, actually, you could start it in Exodus chapter 22 or 32. Is the doctrine of false prophets. And very seldom do you hear anybody on TV, I've never heard of anybody talking about who the false prophets are because nobody wants to point fingers. But yet Jesus pointed fingers, the, the prophets in the Old Testament pointed fingers. And that's why you need to go to God's word to find out what God is saying because, ladies and gentlemen, the darkness that's being revealed now and where we're heading to is a one-world church twisting the Word of God to bring unity to everybody so that everybody can believe in the same God and not be offending people. And that is abomination. It's straight from the pit of hell. It's talked about in, in Revelation chapter 14, chapter 13, the great beast. It's a lie. It's a lie because God commanded light to be separated from darkness, not to be intermingled with darkness. God is not a God of gray area. God is a God of absolutes. You either love me or you hate me. There's no in-betweens. And Jesus, twice in the same chapter, says, do not be deceived. Listen to what he says. He says in, in, 20, in chapter 24, verse 4, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And then he says in verse 23 and 24, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I talked to a lady just the other day in a dollar store and she said, Oh, well, you know, you should come to my church because we only talk out of the Bible. How do you think false prophets preach? They preach out of the Word of God. The difference is they will either omit a word, twist a word, skip a verse, or take things out of context. 
And that's why you need to be in your Bible, reading God's word, and, and just being humble before God, saying, teach me, show me, Lord, show me. Show me my heart. Show me the way I am before your eyes so that I can repent and make you happy so that I can love you with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and love everyone the way you command me. Because, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something right now. Multitudes of people that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and are living in sin and are living in hypocrisy and living in compromise are going to stand before the Lord and he's going to say, I do not know you. Depart from me. That's scary. It's breaking God's heart because people are listening to people behind pulpits Men in TV, people in radio, and they're preaching what the Apostle Paul calls in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4 and 13 through 15. Why do you think, listen to this, why do you think the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. For no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform them into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be the according of their works. Listen to me, hear me, and go to God's word, and there's going to be lots of scriptures so you can go see it yourself. And God made it real. Listen, what I'm going to tell you, this is very important. God made the study of false prophets really easy for us. So take your pen and pencil, pencil and write this down, and you will see that God gives us not only what false prophets preach, but what they live, how they live, what they speak. You will see it, and, you'll, and it'll, it will open your eyes. And you can read Deuteronomy chapter 13, where it talks about false prophets. You can read Ezekiel chapter 13. It talks about false prophets. In 1 Kings chapter 13, it talks about the lying prophet. And understand this, the number 13 biblically means rebellion. It means rebellion. So it's easy. Deuteronomy 13, Ezekiel 13, 1 Kings 13. Then you go to Jeremiah chapter 23, talks about the false prophets. The whole chapter is about the false prophets. So that you can understand when they're talking about their dreams and their visions and, and what they're going to build for God. God says, well, here, you know what? We need to turn to it. Because listen to what God says about the prophets of today then. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Now listen to what the Lord says about it. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people, the Lord's people, to hear my words, listen to what the Lord says. Then they would have turned them from their sin, their evil way, and from the evil of their doings. Verse 25, I have heard what these prophets said, prophesying lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart, who tried to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they tell each other. Their fathers and their mothers, they forgot my name for Baal. You see, false prophets use God's word. They'll use 80% of truth, but they will twist the other 20% or just ignore the other 20%. And that's why you need to go to the Word of God. Remember, it's impossible. It is 100% impossible. And I repeat that. It is 100% impossible to say you love Jesus if you don't love this Word. Why? Because John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through the word of God, and without the word of God, nothing was made that was made. And verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, filled with grace and truth. So Jesus is the word of God. So if you don't have a love for the word of God, the truth of God, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if you have no love for the truth, then you, you will be deceived in these last days. 
and the world counts the world council of churches will deceive you the, the pastors and the preachers excuse me behind churches behind pulpits and churches and on TV will deceive you because you're listening to lies and not looking the word the word of God and what God's word says this is what it is they'll take God's word and they will negate they'll admit they'll admit one word they'll twist one word that's why when the Lord when you're reading God's word and something sticks out to you it's like maybe I should look that up no maybe you should do it because God's trying to show you that wait a minute there's a hidden meaning that's why I I, I heard a uh, I heard a um, a rabbi talk about that when there seems to be a contradiction in God's word that's when you need to go deeper because and I forget the, the Hebrew name it's it, there's a Hebrew name for it where that there's a deeper meaning and you have to go search that's why the Lord says in uh, in Mark 411 he says <clears throat> I just want to read it to you and Jesus said to his disciples, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside of the kingdom of God, all things come in parables. It's been given to us to know the mystery, but we still have to go seek it. That's why it says in Matthew 13, listen to what the Lord says. He says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. So he's telling us that the kingdom of heaven is a hidden treasure, which a man found and he hid, and for the joy over it, he goes and he sells. He sells everything he has and he buys the field. So there, there's what the Lord's saying. You sell it all and you go find the field. You go get the field. And then it, again in verse 45, and the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who... When he found one pearl of a great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Got rid of everything and bought the pearl. The correlation is it's all or nothing with God. And if you're told that, oh, he's just being a fanatic, he's, this is the word of God. Don't take my opinion. You search the scriptures to see if they be so and what God wants. That's why, and I've, and I've shared this before, and I'll share it again. That's why the story of the rich young ruler has been in the Word of God, in the, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because that is the blueprint. That is the foundation of the Gospel. The foundation of the Gospel is the, par the, the story of the rich young ruler where a man saw Jesus, he ran up to Jesus, he knelt before Jesus, and it's in Luke, uh, it's in Luke chapter 18, Matthew chapter 19, Mark chapter 10. This is the foundation of the gospel. A man wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to go to heaven. And you read that for yourself. Matthew 19, Luke 18, Mark 10. I'm not going to read all of it. You need to study to show yourself approved and get the revelation. And you will see when you put them all together, that's why the word of God is a puzzle that you put together, that a man saw Jesus said, how do I get into heaven? He knelt before Jesus. He recognized the authority of Jesus' kingship. He said, good master, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus comes up with a, a profound re, uh, re, re, uh, response to that. He says, why do you call me good? Here's the son of a living God. A man kneels before him and says, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, Why are you calling me good? Only God is good. So when you hear people say, Well, I'm a good person. Well, really? You're better than Jesus because Jesus didn't say he was good. And by the way, there are no good people. Only sinful people. Goodness doesn't get you into heaven. Holiness and being free from sin gets you into heaven. Only having a pure heart gets you into heaven. And you say, well, who's going to get into heaven? Those people that overcome their sin by loving the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving their neighbor as their self. They have a pure heart. Denying ourselves and taking up our cross and dying to sin. And Paul says, die daily. But if people are not teaching you that you have to live a selfless life, 
and not a selfish life. We're teaching you, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. See, and this is this is the deception. This is the great darkness. Is yes, they're preaching Jesus, but is it the Jesus of the Gospels? Is it the Jesus of the New Testament? Is it Jesus of the Old Testament? Is it the Word of God all in its entirety? Do you realize that the World Council of Churches, listen to this, it's founded in 1948. It, it, it's involved in 150 different countries. It has 493,000 priests and pastors. It has 520,000 congregations. And it's very liberal. They accept homosexuals. They, they don't mind homosexuals teaching and preaching, which is completely against God's word, 100% against God's word. They're negating God's word for the sake of unity, the congregation of compromise. And besides the World Council of Churches, there's the ACT, the ACT Alliance International, which has 145 churches and Christian organizations. And they're about unity. You see, it's all about unity at the cost of the Word of God. And there's no, there's no compromising the Word of God. And this is what's scary. And this is why you need the word. No, you need to know the Word of God. You need to search the Word of God. You need to seek the Word of God. You need to be humble before Jesus and say, "Teach me, show me," because the darkness that is coming is going to be so dark that even the elect can be deceived. The words of Jesus in Matthew 24. In 2015, September 27th, in ChristianNews.net, they wrote an article about Rick Warren, Joel Olstein, and T.D. Jakes meeting with the Pope, and they were excited because now they're going to mesh Christianity with Catholicism, which is an abomination. It's a, right from the pit of hell, right from the throne of Satan himself. If he can get Catholics and Christians to unite together... He's done everything he wanted to do in the name of Jesus. That is the other Jesus with the other gospel, with a different spirit, with a different, with, with all complete compromise. God's word is not a God, a, a word of compromise. And if they can succeed, the Joel Olsteins, the Rick Warrens, the T.D. Jakes with the Pope, and Blenius, they've done what they've wanted to do. And that's, that's why when you read the Word of God, John, the Apostle John, who rested his head on the bosom of Jesus, who listened to that divine heartbeat, was exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God and his testimony of Jesus. And when you go further, and that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, I'm sorry, verse 2 and verse 9. But then when you go further into the book of the Revelation, in Chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 6, it talks about when Jesus opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. And what were they slain for? The word of God and the testimony which they held, which was the testimony of Jesus. You see, that's the kicker right there. That's the key. This is the key. The word of God. All of the word of God. Every jot, every tittle from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, it's all the Word of God, or 22. However many chapters are in Revelation, I forget. I'm sorry. Hold on. I don't want to get it wrong. Revelation 22. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, there's no compromise. Ladies and gentlemen, the great darkness that has been revealed is the unity movement that is going on through all of the churches and throughout the world because they don't want to be they don't want to be offensive they want to be religiously correct and you can't find me anywhere in the word of god where jesus wasn't offensive to the religious people paul wasn't offensive by the the persecution that jesus received was from the religious people do you realize that the persecution that paul received was from the religious people the church-going people, the people that knew the law, the people that knew the commandments of God, the people that knew the statutes of God, the people who knew 
what God's word said were the very people that persecuted and sent Jesus to the cross and persecuted the Apostle Paul and the disciples. It hasn't changed. When you speak all of the word of God, people get offended. It's either you love the word of God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or you die and you go to hell. I don't make the rules. That's the word of God. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. And if you're not willing to lay down your life, then you ain't making it. And that's the command. See, what does Jesus say in John chapter 14? Let's we'll, we'll start we'll, we'll start at verse 21 and we'll go to 24. Listen to what Jesus tells us. He says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, the law, the Ten Commandments, it is he who loves me. Now, for those of you who say, well, we can't keep the Ten Commandments, you're right. That's why Jesus came, is that through Jesus in Matthew 5, 17, read this for yourself. It says, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to abolish or get rid of the wall. No, law, no. I have come to fulfill it. See, in the Old Testament, they had the, the sacrifices and the rituals. In the New Testament, Jesus is our sacrifice. So that by loving Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and clinging to him in our time of temptation, we can overcome sin, and we can keep the law through Jesus. He is our salvation. It's in Jesus we can keep the law. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. We're not our own gods. God in his love and his mercy created us, and we're supposed to be humble. Does the potter not have authority over the clay. But you see, when we're born, we're born in the image and likeness of Satan, and we want to be gods. We want to be independent of God. Independence starts with the letter I. I will be like God. And Jesus wants us to be codependent on him, for him to do everything in us and through us and for us. But when you're independent of God and you think you've got it all put together and you think that being a good Catholic is going to make it or a good Baptist or a good Presbyterian or a good Pentecostal is going to make it, then you're in pride and your pride brings you to hell. And the very first sin was pride. That's why God's looking for humility. God wants humble people. What does it say in Isaiah? On this one who I will look, he who is broken of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word, him is who I will look to. That's what the Lord says. And then what does he say in Isaiah 55? He says this. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and have mercy on him. And our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. And in chapter 57, the Lord says again, for thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, talking about the Lord, whose name is holy. I, listen to what the Lord says. This is what he's looking for. This is why the word of God, when you look at the word of God and you look at the whole religious system and every church and every denomination and every non-denomination, every man, woman, and child that's preaching on TV and on the radio, you look and say, wait a minute, something's wrong. And this is what's wrong because listen to what the Lord says. He says, I dwell in a high and holy place with him who is a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I've shared this before and I'll share it again. It's the biblical principle from Genesis to Revelation. Humility brings healing. You'll never need another doctor in your life if you just can humble before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and ask the Lord to heal you. I'm going to tell a story that, that my father shared with me not long after I got down here. And it just goes to show you about how much God loves us, whether you're a Christian or you're a non-Christian. And my father's not a Christian. He's a Catholic. And I've shared some things with him. But I remember my father called me when I got down here from Florida. He says, Frankie, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what, Dad? What is it? He said, God healed my knee. I said, what are you talking about, Dad? He said, this is the humility 
a little Italian man that's been born and raised as a Catholic. But my father said, you know, I'm laying in bed, and I said, God, can you just give me a break? Can you just heal my knee because he was in such great pain? And my father loves to bowl. And he just got humble before God. He said, God, can you, can you just give me a break and just heal my knee? He said, Frankie, when I woke up in the morning, I got a brand new knee. There's no pain. I could run. I could jump. It's a miracle. God is in the miracle business. If we would just get humble before him and say, Lord, I need you. Help me. Heal me. Please hear my prayers. Heal me. It's when we're broken before God and say, God, help me, please. We're not entitled to anything. When we're born, we're on a path of hell, on a path of destruction. It's God in his mercy that sees us wallowing in the miry pit. And he says, you, come here, you. And he calls to us. And when we respond to him and say, Lord, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for forgiving me of my sins. And now I have access to the Father. Thank you. God calls us to be humble before him. We need to be humble and broken before him so that he can heal us. Second Chronicles 7.14 Memorize it, know it, but most importantly, live it. God's not interested in us quoting the Bible. God is interested in us living the word, not preaching the word, not sharing the word, living the word. And Second Chronicles 7.14 says this, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. That's the first responsibility that we have to do. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, and most importantly, turn from your sin, I will hear from heaven and I will heal you, saith the Lord. The Lord is calling us to be humble before him. And the great darkness, ladies and gentlemen, is a religious system filled with arrogance and pride and egos and reputations. And they're winning souls for Jesus. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard how many people have you won to Jesus, how many people have you saved. And I want to throw up every time I hear it because we don't save anybody. All we do is share the word of God. One man plants, another man waters. It's God that gives the increase. We have to let God be God. We have to share his word uncompromised and let the seed fall where it may. Good soil, bad soil, unproductive soil. It's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to walk with God. I've shared this before. I'll share it again. Do you realize the very, the very, in my opinion, the most important figure in the Word of God, instead of Jesus, aside from Jesus, Jesus being number one, Jesus is the most important figure through the Word of God, the second most important figure is Enoch. Enoch is the template. Enoch walked with God. That's all God wants us to do. God wants us to walk with him and talk with him. The second person would be Adam. If you look at the life of Adam and you look at the life of Enoch, Two individuals, the very first one, and then Enoch, they both walked with God. God told Adam, tend to my garden. He didn't tell them to build him anything. He didn't know, tell them to preach to anybody. Of course, there wasn't anybody to preach to, but that's a whole different story. But he walked with Jesus in the garden. In the cool of the day, he walked with the Lord. And then Adam didn't know any better. He didn't ask for a wife because there was no such thing as a wife. He was just content walking with God. And then God said, 
It's not good that man's alone. But though it's love that God had for Adam. It's not good for you to be alone. I'm, good. I'm just happy you're content with me. I'm going to make you a helper. He made her a woman. The responsibility of Adam and Eve was just to tend the garden. It wasn't to build anything in the garden. And then from Adam and Eve, we know what happened. What happened? Satan twisted the word of God so that they would believe a lie. And they lost the innocence that God had given them. They were pure. They had pure hearts. They had hearts of love and humility because they knew that God had created them. God had breathed life into them. It was all the initiation of what God had done. And they were thankful. And they loved him. And they couldn't wait to be with him. And Satan hated every minute of every hour of every day because he's jealous and he wants everyone to fall for his devices and he wanted to destroy the creation that God had made that God had made and he daily and and if you look in Corinthians again in 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 this is how Eve fell, and this is what's going to happen to you if you don't stay in God's word. What will happen to me if I don't stay in God's word? No one is above any of it. Paul preaching to the church, writing an epistle to the church. That's believers. That's us. Every word of, listen to me. Listen to me closely. Listen to me closely. Listen to me closely. Every word of God is for today. It's not for tomorrow. It's not for the, for the culture of back then. Every word, this book is a living document that is for today. I had a conversation with a person not too long ago, and the person said, well, that doesn't really mean that. Why? And then my response is, is well, then what other verses are for, for not this culture? Well, you know, no, every word of God, and if it means it's going against your idol, then you need to find out what's wrong. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul speaking to the church, religious people, church-going people, the church in Corinth. But I fear, Paul was in fear for these people, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus. Now, the word craftiness in the Greek is Greek number 3835. It actually means Daily working craftiness. I've, I've shared this before, and I'm, I'm going to share it again because it's important. Satan doesn't come to you and say, oh, by the way, why don't you eat this fruit? He breaks you down. And that's what the whole religious system does, is it breaks down God's word, and he makes it palatable for everybody. And that's why Paul, again, writing to Timothy, he warns Timothy that there's going to come a time when People are going to heap unto themselves teachers because they have itching ears. They want the prosperity gospel. They want the worldliness gospel. They want an all-inclusive gospel. They want a, a, a unity gospel. That's not the gospel. That's not what this word preaches. Listen to what Paul says. And this is where we're at today. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what the word of God says because this is what's for today. It says, now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times, that's today, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to, listen, to deceiving spirits, demons, and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. They're speaking lies, doctrines of demons, because they're opposed to the truth of what the Word of God says. And that's why when you go to a pastor or a preacher and you start sharing with them the Word of God against things that they're teaching, they get offended. Because their conscience has been seared with hot iron. And it's just like it says in Romans chapter 1, that God has given them up to a reprobate mind because they loved the created thing more than they did Jesus. 
And that's why it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and listen, this, this is all for today. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, in the last days, interesting how Paul, in Tim, addressing Timothy, addresses the last days twice. In Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, in the last days, that perilous times are going to come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Selfish. Selfish men. Men worry about themselves. I was talking to a lady the other day, and she's very distressed about her and her girlfriend were upset because it, the church that they went to, and, and this, when I heard this, I, it got me angry. I wanted to vomit. It, this, is, this is the corruption that's going on in the churches today. And I'll tell you two stories. I'm going to tell you this one first. I'm going to tell you how bad it's gotten. The pastor and his wife were celebrating their 30th anniversary. And one of the elders or whoever got up in front of the church and said, we're going to take a collection. Next week we're taking a collection for our pastor. And it is recommended that everybody bring $200 as a gift offering. In Chicago, we would call that strong-arming somebody, putting them on the arm. And it wasn't just families. Every individual that goes there, we need you to give our pastor $200. And they collected over $30,000 $30, because people were intimidated. You can't find that in the Word of God. And people feel embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed to leave your church and don't be embarrassed to call your pastor out if he's teaching you doctrines of demons. You're going to stand before God one day. And what happens if you're wrong because you didn't want to offend somebody? Show me where Jesus didn't offend people. Show me where Paul didn't offend people. You're going to stand before God. You're going to go to hell because you didn't want to offend the pastor because he's preaching lies. you got some people strong-arming you say, well, you know, you should be giving that money to the church. No, you shouldn't. It's a lie. It's a lie right from the pit of hell. The only thing, listen to me and listen to me closely, the only thing that is supposed to hold congregations together is truth, not intimidation, not compromise. Truth of the Word of God. And that's why the darkness that is coming, this one world church that is going to take place, and it will take place, is a congregation of compromise. It's a congregation of intimidation. And if you're not willing to stand on the Word of God now, you need to do one of two things. You need to either get alone with God and cry out to God and get humble before God and say, God, give me revelation. Let me love you with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach me to love you, Lord. Teach me to obey you. Or go enjoy the world. Eat, drink, and sleep with anybody you want. Have a ball. Know you're going to hell. Because you're a fool if you want to be religious and you don't want to walk in the Word of God and you want to cut and choose and pick and choose and cherry pick the words, the verses that you like and not talk about the words you don't like. You're going to spend eternity, you're going to spend eternity in eternal damnation away from God because you didn't want to obey every jot and tittle. And when I say obey every jot and tittle, I'm talking about the revelation given to us. I'm not talking about picking and choosing. Well, I got to, I got to pluck my eye out. I'm not talking about that. And the Lord will give you revelation on that. The coming darkness is the one world system. With the Catholics and the Presbyterians and everybody getting together, the Muslims, all of them getting together and having just the higher power. We just believe in Jesus. It's like Paul says, it's another Jesus. They're preaching another gospel. All you got to do is be saved. Just accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's impossible. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. It's going to offend some people. But you know what? You need to get along with God. You need to get into the Word of God. And you need to see and get and find out if what those things I'm saying are either true or a lie. But let me tell you something right now. Any Catholic that continues to go to a Catholic church and says, I've accepted Jesus Christ as, as, their, as their Lord and Savior, they're going to go to heaven. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the pit of hell because the whole Catholic religion is based on a lie. As a matter of fact, in 2005, the Catholic Church came out, and I quote, and you can look this up on Google, and if you don't, and if you don't believe me, you go look up on Google, and you will find out that the Catholic Church says that they no longer swear by the truth of the Bible. 
That's what the Catholic Church says. And if you're going to tell me that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you can still go to Catholic Church, and you think you're going to go to heaven, you're going to be very shocked when you stand before the Lord and he says, I don't know you. Because Catholicism has become an idol in your heart. And you love being a Catholic more than you love the Word of God, more than you love Jesus. And if you think you can pray to Mary and think you're going to get into heaven, it doesn't work that way. I'm not going out of tyrant and Catholicism, but that's how abominable and that's how deceptive it all is. Lying to people to get great numbers, have a big reputation, and think that they've made it. Don't trust people behind pulpits. Don't trust me. Trust the Word of God. That's why I can tell you, say, look up what I'm sharing with you. That's why I'm giving you verses and scriptures. You go, and you get along with the Lord. I'll tell you a story. Recently, there was a woman that would come into Panera, and we talked, and I'd always ask her the same question just to see how her, her progression is with the Lord. And one day she came in, we were talking outside, and I asked her a question, and she gave me the same answer. It was the same answer four different times. And I looked at her and I said, Phyllis, I'm really worried about you. She looked at me and she goes, why, Frank? I said, because for four times I've asked you the same question, and four times you've given me the same answer. Something's wrong. And she looked at me. And I said, Phyllis, what you need to do is you need to go and get alone with God, and get alone in your bedroom, and turn the phone off and say, God, I got to know you. I need for you to give me revelation of who you are and what you are. I need to know you. And she looked at me and she goes, and this is exactly what she says. Hmm, I can do that. I said, then Phyllis, do it. Because eternity is at, is, is, is at stake here. You don't want to go to hell. No, I don't want to go to hell. Then go get alone with the Lord. Go lock yourself up in the bedroom. Take your Bible and say, Lord, I'm not going to get out of here until I get revelation of you. And she left. About three or four weeks later, I forget the time frame, I was sitting in the booth and I was talking to somebody, and here walks Phyllis. And Phyllis has got a smile from ear to ear. And I said, hey, Phyllis. And she looks at me and she goes, I did it. I had no idea what she was talking about. I said, I don't, I, I don't understand you. What do you mean you did it? You did what? She goes, I did it. I said, what, Phyllis? What did you do? And the person I was talking with excused themselves. And I said, Sid, tell me, what, what did you do? You got this big smile on your face. She goes, Frank, I got alone with the Lord. And I locked myself in the bedroom and I got on my knees and I God, I took my Bible and I said, God, I got to know you. I want to know if, 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 if this is all true. I got I to gotta know you. She goes, Frank, she gave me, she said, before she sat down, she gave me a kiss on the cheek. She gave me, put money in my hand. And she goes, it's a brand new Bible. I can't stop reading the Bible. Words are just jumping out left and right. It's a new Bible. God gave me revelation. That's what you need. That's what you need, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you need. Not this dry, dead stuff in the churches where, where people are afraid to make a sound. The Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and the Catholics. You need life. And then Jesus' is life. And Jesus' is light. Not that dead religion you're following. You need revelation of the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he who sits at the right hand of the Father. He whose eyes are too pure to look at sin, him whose eyes burn as a flame of fire. You need to know him on your own because I'm telling you, it's going to get really dark, really dark. And they're going to twist God's word in every way, shape, or form to make you believe that what they're doing is in the name of God. And your eternal salvation is at stake. They built a $500 million museum of the Bible. A half a billion dollars. They built a museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. that was revealed and opened up in November of 2017. And this is the greatest monument of man and the abomination before God you'd ever want to know. And they purposely put very little references of Jesus in it. 
and people think so, and many people think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread is an abomination because the greatest gift that God has given mankind, God, God could give us no greater gift than the manifestation of Jesus. He poured every ounce of love that he has for mankind into Jesus. And you're going to sit and tell me that you don't want to offend people because of Jesus? A museum of the Bible that is built by a man, the chairman of Hobby Lobby, the, the, the person that professes to be a Christian, Steve Green, you're going to tell me you're a Christian and then you're embarrassed about Jesus because he's going to offend people? And if you don't believe me, go on my website and you'll see I've got it linked. And if you want me to take it a step further, I will. I called, I called Steve Green, and I talked to his publicist. And when I shared with him what I'm sharing with you now, he was shocked. He had no idea. He said, well, Frank, why don't you call the museum? And I told him this. I said, I've called the museum twice. They will not return my phone calls. And I've got a news article that states that they were They were afraid that it would just offend too many people. God gives us his whole heart and soul in his beloved son that suffered and bled, shed his blood for us, died and was resurrected. God gives us the greatest sin, the greatest son. God has given us the greatest gift in his son that mankind could ever know. And this is how we treat it. And we, and we wonder why judgment and vengeance is going to come upon us that the world has never seen, not since the beginning of man. Because we have taken the Son of God, the Son of the living God, the Lamb of God that died for us, and we've trampled him under our feet. We've counted the blood that Jesus shed is a common thing. And we've insulted the Spirit of grace that God has given us. And now God is going to bring vengeance against us. A vengeance that the world has not known. The eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, neither is entering the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that have hated him. Now I misquoted that verse because it's the flip side of Corinthians where it says, and just so you know that I know, we're going to read it. In 1 Corinthians, Chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The eye is not seen, nor the ears heard. Make sure you write this down and read it for yourself. The eye is not seen, nor the ears heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So that means we can't comprehend what God has for us to love him. But you have to look at the other side of that. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. And the severity of God is this, the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, neither is entered in the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those who hate him. And Psalm 81.15 in the New American Standard Version says, and look that up, Psalm 81.15, New American Standard, makes it plain as day. Those that hate the Lord pretend obedience to him, and their time of punishment will be forever. God does not judge on a bell-shaped curve. Either you love them with your whole heart or you don't. And those people that don't, that are being hypocrites and living religious lives, are going to experience a vengeance and a judgment that is going to be unprecedented in all of humanity. And part of that is going to be the, the unification of a world church. Because God himself... As it says in 2 Thessalonians, listen to this. This is why you need to be afraid. You need to know. Because if you don't have a love for the truth, if you don't have a love for this word, because Jesus is the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you do not have a love for the truth, if you don't have a love to be obedient to the truth, the word of God says this. The coming of the lawless one, Satan, and the false prophets, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and wonders, and with all unrighteousness. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. 
and listen to this. And then we're going to go even further. So it's very important. That's why you have to have a love for the truth, not a love for your religion, not a love for being a Catholic, not a love for being a Baptist or Presbyterian or a Pentecostal. It's a love for the Word of God. It's the love for, the, for Jesus, the Son of the living God. If you don't have a love for this, you're going to go to hell. That's a fact. You have to have a love for the truth because if you don't, listen to what it says. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. Verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God will allow you to be deceived. God will allow you to be deceived. He'll send you strong delusion because you don't have a love for the truth. And if you think that's just one verse, no. This is how serious God is about his word. You have to have a love for Jesus. Well, you're hurt so much in strength or you're going to be deceived. And when you're deceived, you're going to go to hell. Listen to what God's word says. Isaiah 66. Check them. Chapter 66, verse 3. The second part says, Just as they have chosen their own ways, they're not choosing the word of God, they're choosing their own ways. They're choosing the way of man and not God's word. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, their sins, the Lord says, so I will choose their delusions, and I will bring their fears on them. Because when the Lord called, no one answered. And when I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes, and they chose that in which I do not delight. The Lord will choose for you a delusion so that you can believe a lie. That's why it says in Isaiah chapter 5, that with much Joy, they descend into hell. Do you realize that if you're not willing to give up everything to follow Jesus, you have a gold calf? And you realize what the children of Israel said when they created the gold calf? Do you realize that when Moses was on the mountain with God, and the people manipulated Aaron to build this gold calf because Aaron had the love for praises of people more than the praises of God. They manipulated Aaron to build him a gold calf. Do you realize that the children of Israel sat before, before their idol? They ate and they drank. They rose up to play and they said, this is our God that brought us out of Egypt. They were deceived. And if you're not going to love Jesus, you'll be deceived. You'll die a Catholic and you'll go to hell for eternity. You'll die as a Baptist. You'll go to hell for being a Baptist. You'll, go, you'll die in hell. You'll die being a Presbyterian. There's no denomination in the Word of God. It's following Jesus and loving Jesus and walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus and being obedient to Him. That's Christianity. It's not being a denomination. It's not being part of a religion. It's not going to a church. It's walking and talking with the living Son of God. Jeremiah chapter 13. Interesting. Jeremiah 13. Number of rebellion. Listen to what the Lord says. You who watch this video, listen to what the Lord is saying. You who think that you got it all put together, that think, oh, I'm a Catholic. No, what he's saying is a liar. I'm a Presbyterian. I, no, listen to what God says. Listen to what the Lord says. Hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before, before he causes darkness. And before your feet stumble on the dark mountains. And while you are looking for light, the Lord turns it into the shadow of death. And he makes it dense darkness. And if you will not hear it, 
My soul will weep in secret for your pride. God is calling us to humility and brokenness. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Cling to your religion and God will send you strong delusion. It's give it all up for Jesus or you'll be sent to hell. That's a It's in humility we come before the Lord. It's in humility that we get on our knees and we ask God for forgiveness for loving other things, persons, places, and things more than him. It's in Jesus. God's calling us to a place of repentance because what's coming is unprecedented. It's unprecedented what's coming. And I know I've shared this before, but I feel I need to share this again. In the book of the Revelation, the Lord's given me insight. This is how bad it's going to get. It's going to The judgment and the vengeance of God himself is going to execute on humanity for, for breaking his covenant. This is going to be unprecedented. It's going to be a time that never has been or ever will. Hear me. Hear me loud, please. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Think about it. Heaven, the place of great rejoicing, the place of great praise, the place of great worship, the place of great love. The place where people are rejoicing in the in the blessed Lamb of God has become quiet. Not a soul, not a peep, not one harp string, not one trumpet blown. But heaven has become silent. Why? Because now, in opening the seventh seal. It is revealed the great and cruel day of vengeance of God, spoken of in the Old Testament as the day of the Lord. And you read in Revelation chapter 8, the first trumpet, the second trumpet, the third trumpet, the fourth trumpet, verses 7 through 12. Verse 13, read it for yourself, Revelation 8, 13. And when I, John, looked and I heard the angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, he's warning. And the angel saying, whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet. And the three angels who are about to sound. When Jesus opens that seal, the unveiling, the revealing of the vengeance of a holy God for the covenant that he made with man is revealed. And I know I've shared verse 6 with you, but the Lord's given me revelation and on verses 1 through 5. Verse 1, then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. The word bottomless pit in the Greek is actually the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, the bottomless pit, the smoke arose out of the pit. Like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power. And the scorpions of the earth have power. The scorpions, the scorpions here 
is a reference to the demons that are released. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the green earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when this fifth angel sounds, the demons from the abyss are going to manifest themselves. And that's why it says in verse 6, in verse 5, it says, they've given power to torment people. A torment that cannot be described in words today. And that's why he says in verse 6, in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. God is going to unleash a vengeance and a hell here on earth. Because we've not kept this covenant, and we've not walked in the fear of him. And we've taken Jesus, and we've used him as an excuse for our sin. We've not loved Jesus, the Lamb of God. We've not loved him. And God is going to pay back in retribution. Because where much is given, much is required. We live in a country, America. It was the greatest nation. And I use the word past tense was because we're going downhill quick. And God has allowed that. In 1963, they took Bibles out of, out of schools. And after 1963 is when the divorce rate went up. Abortion became legal. Homosexual marriage became legal, making America the new Sodom and Gomorrah. And what's even scarier is is that the inception of the electronic church in the 70s got carried away and we're interested in numbers and quantity and not quality. And the electronic church that was given birth in the 70s and exploded into the 80s started lying people, lying to people. Hundreds Maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people got saved under that. And I'm not discounting that because God looks at a person's heart. When people are looking for God, God will use anything and anyone to get their attention. But now what has happened is the word of God has become a business. It's not showing reverence and love to our beloved Savior. And that's why the judgment is going to come. It's going to be unprecedented. And I beg you, I implore you to get into God's word and seek God for yourself. And like Phyllis, get in your bedroom. Get in a place that you're quiet. Get in the car and say, Lord, i got to know you. i got to know who you are. That's how Jesus changed my life. I was in a very dark place in 1984. And I was crying in my bed. I said, God, if you're God, i got to know you. I see religious hypocrisy all around me. All I see is hypocrites. I want to know who you are. And then the Lord put a hunger in my heart to start reading his word, and that's when Jesus changed my life. It's not about being religious. It's not about belonging to a church. It's not about being an elder or a deacon in a church. There's no titles in God's word. It's walking with Jesus and being a Christian. That's what's in God's word. If God decides to put a title on you, then God himself will ordain you and you'll know it. How many times I've run into people saying, well, I'm, I'm Bishop so-and-so and I'm this and I'm that, and they start sharing God's word with them, they get offended or they don't come back or they get angry at me. Well, if you're a bishop of God, wouldn't you like all of God's word? Why are you just picking and choosing? It doesn't make sense. Men are going to seek to die, and death will flee from them. And I've shared this before, I share it again. There's coming a time, ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me loud and clear. There's going to come a time it's going to be so bad. It is going to be so, words cannot describe the judgment that God is coming. It's going to be so mad, 
so bad a person's going to put a gun to their head, they're going to blow their brains out. And to their amazement, they're going to look and see their brains are splattered on the wall, and they're not going to understand why. And I'm going to explain to you why that's going to happen, because God, who sits on the throne, who created heaven and earth, who creates man, God is tired of man manipulating his word, twisting his word, and being God. It is God, Deuteronomy chapter 39, uh, chapter 32, verse 39. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is no one who can deliver you from my hand. For if I lift my hand to heaven and I say, as I live forever, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance on my enemies and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. With the blood of the slain and the captains, captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemy. See, it's God that gives life. First Samuel chapter two, verse six and seven. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he brings up. The Lord makes poor and rich. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. The Lord brings low and he lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust, and he lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. God made man with a will. <clears throat> he gives us a free will. God didn't create robots. God created man with a free will, and he showed his love to mankind. That he loved us so much that he sent his only son, his only begotten son, to die on a cross. That whosoever believes on him can be saved. It doesn't mean saved to go to heaven. It means if you believe that Jesus will, will deliver you in your time of temptation, and you hold to Jesus, Jesus will save you and get you through that temptation. That's actually Romans chapter 9. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved when you believe on jesus that lord i love you more than my temptation i'm holding on to you i don't want to, i want to be like jesus i don't want to be like satan we have the nature of satan we don't want that you see that's the whole core of the world council of churches is that they don't want to die and sacrifice for jesus as jesus sacrificed for us they want to keep it a big religious system that they can control people The walk with Jesus is a life of self-sacrifice, not self-gratification, not self-satisfaction. And God is calling us to that. And see, when we live as hypocrites, and we don't get on our face before a holy God and say, God, forgive me, please. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to sin anymore. Lord, break my heart over my sin. Help me to overcome my sin. Grant me the grace to overcome my sin so I can be like you. When we are not living like Christians, when we're living like ourselves, and we're living like Satan, the Word of God says this, Psalm 139. It says, Your enemies take your name in vain. Psalm 139, verse 20. Do you want to be a friend of God or do you want to be an enemy of God? See, you choose. I choose. God called Abraham his friend because Abraham walked in covenant with him. Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 left his family and friends, left everything to go to a land where he didn't even know where he was going. In Genesis chapter 17, and this is 
This is a perfect example. This is a great example that, ladies and gentlemen, you need to study to show yourself approved and ask the Lord to teach you because this is this next example I'm going to show you is going to blow your mind. It's it's phenomenal. And this is when the Lord opens up the treasures of the Word of God and He gives us the pearls. It's like, wow. In Genesis chapter 17, the New King James and every translation, and I went through 65 or 67, 66 translations. Every English translation translates this verse, verse 1, saying this. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Every English translation that I found says that. But I went to a translation that the rabbis translate the Hebrew to. It's a wonderful uh, website. It's called Sefaria, S-E-F-A-R-I-A dot org. It's the rabbi's translation of the word of God. And this is what the Lord opened up to us. Listen to what he shares. The translation says this. I am almighty God. Are you ready? Walk in my ways. And be perfect. You see, when we walk in the ways of God, when we walk in the covenant of God, that he is our God and that we are his children, then God opens up heaven. And all the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 28 are poured upon us because we're walking in covenant with a loving God, a God whose name is Jealous, who is a consuming fire, just loves us and he protects us and he watches over us because we're walking in covenant. He is our God and we are his children and we're not pretending obedience to him. We're walking as his friend. But when we become religious and we live in hypocrisy and we're not walking in his ways, then we're being his enemy. God doesn't want us to be his enemy. He reached down from heaven. He wants us to be his friend. And he continues to pour forth his love to us because it's his goodness that leads us to change our ways. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. It's the blessings that God gives us that leads us to change our ways, to love him and to walk like him. But if you want to live selfishly and selfish and self-gratifying and you want to do what you want to do and you want to go your ways, God will do everything in his power to get your attention. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10 or 12 that God disciplines those who he loves. And in that discipline, if it means sending sickness and disease upon us, God will do that. If it means sending, now listen to me and listen very closely to me, okay? Because what I'm about to share is going to be very radical, but when you put it in context, in the balance and context of God's word, it'll open your eyes and you'll see a God that loves us so much because you have to understand something. And the understanding is this, is that when we are rebellious and we are proud and we're doing the things that are contrary to God, God will work overtime to get us to get on the straight and narrow. But if you want to be rebellious and you want to live the way you want to be and you want to be disobedient and rebellious to the word of God, God will do everything he can to get you off that road because that road is a road to hell. It's the broad road of destruction. If you want to live a life of hypocrisy, it's a broad road of destruction. If you want to live a life of rebellion, it's the broad road of destruction. If you want to live a life of pride and arrogance and think you're better than everybody. It's the broad road to destruction. And God will do everything in his power to get you off of that broad road to destruction, to get you on the narrow road. And if that means he's got to send cancer on you to get your attention, he'll do it. Now you're going to say, that's awful dramatic, but what, what's the alternative? The alternative is 
I send him cancer to humble him, to call on me so I can heal him. Or he's going to die and go to hell. I don't want him to die and go to hell. But you see, we have been lied to by religions, every religion, that God doesn't heal. God doesn't do those things. It's a lie. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a lie from the pit of hell. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, God all over the place talks about how we heal. In Exodus chapter 13, in Psalm 20, in Psalm 103, all through God's word, he promises us to heal him if we just get humble. If you have cancer, if you have problems right now, you're sick and diseased, if you just get alone with God and get humble and say, God, help me, please teach me, show me my role, my show me where I'm wrong. I'm a miracle because God spared me. When a doctor tells you, Frank, you should be dead, you understand that the gift of life is exactly that. It's a gift. It's a gift that God gives us. And we need to be responsible with that gift, but we need to know what God wants. And if God sends cancer on us, it's because he's trying to get our attention, not because he hates us, because he sees that we're on the wrong road, we're on the broad road, and God wants to bring us to the right road. If you're suffering from depression or anxiety, it's because God's trying to get your attention. Listen to what the curses of God are. When we are not walking in the covenant of God, when we are not walking in obedience to the covenant of God, listen to what he says. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all of his commandments and statutes, which I command you, that all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will send upon you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until you have consumed from the land in which you go to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, and severe burning fever, with the scourge. This is Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15, now I'm at 22. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe and burning fever, with sword, with scorching, with mildew, of which you will perish. Verse 27, the Lord will strike you with the boils of, of Egypt, with the tumors, and with scab, with itch, of which you cannot, you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. This is burnout right here. You shall grope at noonday in the, as a blind man gropes in the darkness, and you will not prosper in your ways. You shall be only oppressed and plunder continually, plundered continually. No one shall save you. Now listen to what really gets thick. And God is doing this all to get us on the right road, to keep us on the narrow road, not the broad road, not the Catholic road, not the Baptist road, not the Pentecostal road, not the Presbyterian road, on his road. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, the Lord will bring on you all the diseases of the world in which you are afraid of and which you cling to. And every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you. Listen to this. Because the Lord wants to bless us, and if we reject the blessings of God, if we reject the salvation that's only in Jesus and not in a religion or a denomination, if we reject walking with Jesus in holiness and righteousness, the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. And you shall be plucked off of the land which you are to possess. <clears throat> if you want to read more, I just picked out a few. Read all of the curses in Deuteronomy 28 and read all the blessings. And those blessings and those curses are for those people who are either obedient and walk in covenant with God or disobedient and break the covenant of God. God is no respecter of people. Come one, come all, saith the Lord. Come, eat, eat of the bread of life freely. Drink of the water of life freely. 
You need to get into the Bible. You need to get in your word. You need to read God's word and find out the false prophets. Matthew chapter 7. Well, let's go back. Matthew 24, when Jesus says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. So if possible, it's even, even the elect will be deceived. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 23 is a blueprint for the false prophets of today. Because Jesus says, enter, verse 13, we're going to start uh, chapter 7, verses 13 through 23. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by that gate. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few that find it. Now Jesus gives us two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. And then he goes on to tell us, verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. See, we've been taught that the fruits are the success. Well, our church is the fastest growing church in Chicago. Our church does this and that's not the fruits Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Humility, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, gentleness, kindness, and faith. Galatians chapter 5. And that's why he says you need to be a fruit inspector. And I want to, I want, I want to share this with you guys. So It's a lie, ladies and gentlemen, when people say you're not allowed to judge. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm going to tell you why it's a lie from the pit of hell. And they use Matthew, and I and I understand that. And we're, going to, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Because Jesus, the Son of the living God, gives us the authority to judge. Now listen to me. Because first off, you have to, you have to understand something. The word judge means you make a decision. When you go to court, you stand before a judge. And what does he do? He listens to the evidence, the prosecutor, the defense, and then that judge makes a decision. Are you with me? Makes a decision. Jesus says, do not judge. We're in John chapter 7, verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. You see, when Jesus says, do not judge by a, according to appearance, that's exactly what he's saying in Matthew chapter 7. Judge not, lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. He's saying don't judge by appearance. Somebody walks by, you can't make a comment and say, well, that person's this or that person's that. That's, that's wrong. But when Jesus says, but judge with righteous judgment, he's saying you listen to the person, you observe the person, you, you, you dissect them, and then you take it and you correlate it against the word of God, and you make a decision. Now, he gives the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers the fivefold ministry, and Christians the discernment so that we know whether or not those brothers and sisters or those people are walking in the light of God's word. How can I help you to get on a narrow path if I don't judge you? And my responsibility is, like it says in Timothy, is to correct those in humility and in love. Not to, be not to be condemning. In Proverbs 31, the Lord, and see, when you go to God's word and you ask the Lord to teach you and show you, he'll give you the insight and he'll give you the teaching so that you can be prepared and you can share like what I'm sharing. Listen to what the Lord says in Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9. Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all those who were appointed to die. Open your mouth. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the needy and poor. I have to. It's my responsibility to share with you the truth so that I can get you from the broad road of destruction to the narrow road. Now, what do you, what you do with those seats? That's your responsibility. But don't, ladies and gentlemen, do not be afraid to righteously judge people because the bride of Jesus are those that want to snatch people from the pit. 
We want to contend for the faith. Not the faith of a religion, not the faith of a church, not the faith of a denomination. But the true faith in loving Jesus and being obedient to Jesus. Snatching them out of the fire. How else can we help people that are hurting unless you judge them righteously and share with them? And when you do a study, you're going to find out all through God's word, he says to judge righteously. 1 Corinthians 5, 12, Proverbs 31, 8, 9. Leviticus 19, 15, Deuteronomy 1, 17, 16, 18 through 20, or uh, 16, 18 and 22, Exodus 18, verses 22 and 26. He tells us that. See, we've been destroyed for our lack of knowledge because we leave, we, we, we've been believing the garbage being spewed behind pulpits and not asking the Lord to show us and teach us. And when you do that, God can just open up a word, and it's like a rose, it's like this, and then God starts opening up, and it's more and more beautiful, and it's like, wow, and then when God gives you that revelation, it changes your heart and your mind, and you start to understand, and you see through the eyes of God, and you hear with the eyes, the ears of Jesus, and you have the heart of Jesus, because true Christianity, not being a Catholic, not being a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Pentecostal, true Christianity is walking with the heart of Jesus, having the love, the humility, and compassion of Jesus. That's Christianity. Why do you think Jesus says they'll know you by your fruit? They'll know you by your love. Jesus says to the disciples, they'll know you by your love. They'll know there's something different because we're not taking any glory for ourselves. I can't take glory for anything. I can't take credit. I can't, unless God grants me breath, I can't do anything. How dare we try and take credit for anything? That's why in John chapter 14, we kind of got off of, off of it a little bit. <clears throat> John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. But now listen to verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. If we're not keeping the word of God, and we're not keeping the words of Jesus, we're showing them that we don't love them. That's why Luke 6, 20, 6, 46 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? And people say, well, we're supposed to love and preach the gospel. We're supposed to share the gospel, not try and shove a Bible down people's throats. We're supposed to live the gospel, not live hypocritically. There's a difference. In chapter 15, Jesus says this, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. The call that Jesus has is that we lay down our life for him as he laid down his life for us. That's why it says in John 12, it says, He who loves his life will lose it. And, wait a minute, you know what? Let me go to verse 24. That's more important. John 12, 24, 25, 26. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, he remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. He who loves his life, if you're not willing to give up and sacrifice your life, then go enjoy the world. But when you give up your life, God will bless us with fruit, and that fruit will remain and will be abundant. That's the fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternity. See, when you, you ask the Lord to show you your heart the way he sees it, that's what brings true repentance, because then you see how selfish and self-centered you are, how much you don't love God. How much you want to be religious instead of really loving Jesus the way he asks us to? Then we can be broken before God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 2 goes with Jude. I'm going to read this. And you need to understand this, and that's why you need to go in God's word and seek the Lord while he may be found. And understand this, 
Why do you think it says, seek the Lord while he may be found? Because there's going to be a time when God's not going to be found, ladies and gentlemen. When divine judgment and vengeance comes, those that are in the ark will be protected. Can't even imagine what's going to happen to those that aren't in the ark. Second Peter chapter 2 says, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Now listen to what he says, and this is why you have to listen to what the Word of God says and then dissect it amongst the, the people that are talking and, and, teach, and teaching behind pulpits and the, and the radio and the preachers and teachers behind pulpits who will secretly... Who will secretly bring in destruction, heresy, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, the love of money. I'm, I'm just getting time. My time is running out here. <laughs> But this is important because you know what? This is your homework, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Second Peter and Jude go together because he says, going back, he says, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. That's lying. Those are doctrines of demons. Secretly. And then in Jude, verse 4, it says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. You could say secretly. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and denied the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Modern Christianity is the only culture in all of the world that has no structure to it because they've painted this broad picture of grace that everything's under grace and people are living lawlessness. They're living in lawlessness. They've taken the grace of God and made it a license to live in sin. And part of your homework is you read 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude, and then you will see that the grace of God in Titus, and part of your homework, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us something. It teaches us to deny ungodliness and to deny unworldliness, and to deny worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. See, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, goes along with Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. And this is the foundation of the gospel. And that's this. When you look at Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, you're going to see... That these verses are repeated. I'm going to read this off to you. Luke 9.23 goes along with Luke 14.25-31, Matthew 10.38-39, Matthew 16.24-26, Mark 8.34-36, and 10.21. Because it's the foundation, ladies and gentlemen. If they're not teaching you to deny yourself and take up your cross and give up your life and lose your life for Jesus... It's another gospel with another Jesus, and these are false prophets and false teachers teaching you another gospel with another Jesus, and they're giving you worldly spirits. And if they're not teaching you to come out of the world and be separate, James 4.4, 4, read it yourself. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. And on that note, I've been, give, I've been given notice that it's time for me to, to end. And I end on this. It's going to get bad this year, ladies and gentlemen, really, really bad. And you've got to be in the Word. And you've got to give up your life to save it. And I just encourage you and I beg you to get in God's Word and love the Word of God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength to live, move, and have your being in the Word of God. And repent, not with words, but with actions. And prove to God that you mean business by changing your wicked ways and turning from your sin and loving Jesus more than your idols. And then that I say, good night. <laughs>